I'm Andrew Patterson from interest.co.nz and with me today, angel investor and serial entrepreneur Ken Morse. Welcome. It's great to be back. It really is. It's, uh, I think, the 10th year I've been coming to New Zealand. Ken, you've been coming to New Zealand for uh, more than 10 years. You travel a lot internationally, so you're in a good position to evaluate uh, New Zealand as far as the rest of the world goes from an entrepreneurial perspective. Where are we standing right now? So for, we're blessed to be working in, in uh, all over Spain, in Scotland, um, uh, R- Romania, Middle East, other countries. So we really have a way of kind of benchmarking uh, New Zealand. And you're right, there's a growing recognition everywhere in the world about the importance of, uh, of entrepreneurship. And it comes from sort of the same basic uh, numbers. The, Population's rising, expectations are rising even faster. There's a shortage of good jobs. The public sector has reached its limit in terms of its ability to provide meaningful employment. So everybody turns to the private sector, and that means entrepreneurship. Um, But the entrepreneurship skills and the supporting ecosystem are in short supply. Of course, if we go back a decade or so, we didn't really ever hear that much about entrepreneurship or innovation. Why are we hearing so much? Or why are those terms becoming so much more a part of the lexicon these days? Well, in most of the major countries of, of the world, uh, the Western world, large companies aren't growing. In fact, they're, they're shrinking in, in Western Europe. And the job growth isn't there. So where are we going to get the jobs? Um, in, in North America, all of the net new jobs created uh, have come from young companies, not from big firms. When we think of the challenges, though, of the entrepreneurship model versus the corporate model, you're talking about a different type of management and a different type of manager, aren't you? So what are some of the skill sets that, that, that you believe are important, and can this actually be taught? Yeah, so entrepreneurship absolutely can be taught. Um, and the number one skill set, or I think, is, is integrity in the entrepreneur and ambition and the ability to attract and recruit top talent. Um, the companies that do well, uh, the, the CEO and the top management team are incredibly focused on delivering value to customers. Uh, they care about customers with, with passion. Um, there aren't any rules. Uh, maybe the definition of entrepreneurship is pursuing an opportunity without having all the resources that you need. And, moving forward and gaining them. I think the best sources of money for young companies are customers. I don't, I don't think that in today's competitive environment, an entrepreneurial team, even an experienced one, can raise serious money without having customers in the picture, and including signed contracts. I like the bootstrapping approach, and that's popular in New Zealand. So the idea is you, you really don't get going until you've got your first order in place. Uh, absolutely. And your first customers. And the first customers in the beginning might be small companies that nobody's ever heard of, but you won't get serious traction until you have some marquee customers that have, a, that have global recognition. Now, in New Zealand, we've got plenty of companies that can get started, but do they have a plan to go global? Uh, and you more or less need that plan at the beginning. And that's what we're teaching in these workshops, is you have to have a sales plan, you have to have a people plan. Where are you going to recruit the talent to build uh, the, the enterprise? Um, the CEO is always the chief sales officer. And so what we're teaching is the skills that are needed to build a global company through selling. What about the most common mistake that you see uh, entrepreneurs making? Where, where are the traps in this business? I think that it's very, very easy to get enthusiastic and to believe your own story and to lose focus. And I think the biggest mistake that young companies make everywhere in the world, not just New Zealand, is trying to do too much. Most companies die of indigestion, not starvation. And narrow, narrow focus. 
I think a second mistake that companies make, and, and we're certainly teaching the dangers of that, is to have a horizontal sales strategy rather than a vertical. You have to pick a vertical, be expert in what it takes to be successful in that vertical, get some customers that love you and where you deliver enormous value, and then leverage those positive references uh, on the global stage, one market at a time. So just explain the difference between those horizontal and vertical yeah. strategies. So some uh, enthusiastic uh, software entrepreneurs might say, well, we'll sell to everybody. And we call that boiling the ocean. And the, it, it doesn't work. Everybody is not a customer. Uh, everybody is not a sales strategy. A sales strategy is to have a few specific companies in exactly the same business. They might be pharmaceutical companies, they might be insurance companies, they might be hospitals, uh, whatever, and having a product that delivers enormous value to those customers and that solves a problem where there's real pain. Because you can't build a sustainable business unless you're the aspirin for somebody's pain. And that person who has the pain better have money, power, influence, a budget, and knows how to write a PO and isn't afraid to do it. Because without a purchase order, your company's out of business. The reality is, of course, and we all know, know this from you know, longevity of business, that, that businesses aren't successful, you know, a high percentage of them fail, and, and that, of course, is part of the risk of the entrepreneurship model, isn't it? And there's an acceptance of that and a need to accept that, but how much can those uh, risk factors be, be mitigated, do you think? Well, it turns out that if you have a team of reasonable adult, adults, who know something about business and who have been successful in the business environment before and who know how to get things done. A team of experienced business professionals. Their probability of success is very high. Okay? And the probability of success is further enhanced by their ability to get the first few customers. And it will be much quicker for experienced executives to get customers because they will have done business with these guys before and they'll understand the value of proposition. So that's one way to reduce risk. The second way to reduce risk, and that's why governments ask, ask to help, is let's provide just-in-time training for the entrepreneurial team. Let's give them what they need at the time they need it. It will have been a long time earlier that they were in university and they will have gotten a framework for thinking about the problem, but that isn't what they need now. They need to know in a very short, concentrated period of time, how am I going to get the purchase orders? How am I going to get the customers? How am I going to get access to the networks that are going to help me? The other thing, you want to have a supportive entrepreneurial ecosystem that understands that failure is part of the process. And that's what's been terrific uh, over the years that I've been here. Companies like Deloitte, NZTE, GNS, MSI, um, Ice House, University of Auckland, they've all supported these training by entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs because it's a supportive ecosystem. What about the role of government uh, in all of this? What role should governments play in stimulating entrepreneurship and innovation? Well, th this government states it perfectly. They say, our job is to give you what you need to be successful, and then step out of the, out, out of the way as much as possible. And, and that's, I think, the role of government. It's not zero. I'm not a, a libertarian by any means. I think government provides more than infrastructure, more than roads and ports and bridges and so on. They often provide the first grants that enable teams to, to get off dead center. And I think those grants are good use of government money. I don't like companies that live only on grants. I think they should try to get customers as soon as possible. You want to have a government that will support and, and nurture the companies along the way by being a great customer, making a quick decision to buy from the companies and paying on time. Okay? And then finally, when they go global, you've got the NZTE beachhead program, you've got 
uh, talented people in different countries who, by the way, mostly are business people, like John Cochran in China. He, he helped to build Comtest. Now he's in China helping the next generation. These are the kinds of people you want to have uh, helping you. And lastly, I think it's a fact that New Zealanders have a tailwind in global markets. People like Kiwis. And that's an advantage and perhaps shouldn't be understated. It shouldn't be understated. And there's a couple of other things. Not just likable. People trust Kiwis. This country has integrity. Government processes are clean. Business practices are clean. That's kind of in short supply in the world. And people respect that. So you go, you go in with an advantage. However, you still have to punch above your weight. Talking to one entrepreneur recently, he exited uh, at about 30 million and said that there was, there was very little growth left in the company. He'd kind of reached that natural point to exit. But he also said that increasingly businesses uh, who are wanting to, to get more than, say, about 2 or $3 million worth of capital struggle in that market, they will be forced to effectively relocate to America to, to achieve that. Do, do you agree with that assessment? Well, um, I, I don't know who he, he was. I'm sure he's wonderful, but I, I do have a different view. Um, I think that Kiwi companies need to become two-legged firms with two offices, uh, a development office here, uh, and probably a commercial office in the largest concentration of customers and competitors, which might be North America, it might be Germany, it might be the UK. But they, their ability to achieve sustainable global growth will come from having talented sales people and executives located close to customers. Okay? And that's not exiting. That's not relocating, that's co-locating. So I'm a, into the co-location, taking the advantages of, of New Zealand and matching them with the advantages of being close to the customer. Now the thing about outside capital, you won't get outside capital into a Kiwi company unless they can watch it. And they will want a local investor to know the company here and look out, and they'll want to help you in the market where they are. So if your chosen market is Germany, you probably want to have a German VC. If it's uh, New York, you probably want to have a New York VC. It depends on your business what kind of uh, overseas capital you have. And then the last thing, let's go ahead and talk about exit. Um, after 10, 12, 15 years of building the business, some of the investors may want or need to exit. That's normal. And they'll probably recycle the money into the next startup. And what kind of exits are available? More than ever, everywhere in the world, exits are selling out to large companies. And I've heard people in New Zealand say, oh, isn't it a shame, you know, he sold to, you know, a big company. I don't agree. First of all, exits enable the early investors to cash out and go on to the next investment. And inevitably, they recycle the money. They don't buy some vineyard and, and retire. And usually, the foreign investment in the Kiwi company enables them to expand their market position, to hire people locally. And also, there are some customers who just will never buy from a Kiwi company unless they're a division of General Electric. Now, take the case of Comtest. They started more or less in a garage in Christchurch. <clears throat> they had a horizontal strategy. They came to one of these workshops eight years ago. They switched to a vertical strategy. They executed beautifully. They built an important business. They wound up dominating the measure and test of wind turbines uh, around the world. And GE bought them. The investors got liquid and are going to use the money wisely to build new businesses. The, the, the CEO, uh, John Cochran, one of the CEOs, went to China to help the next generation. Mark Radburn remained the CEO. They've already hired a lot of people with the help of GE, and they got customers who always waited because they were small, and now they're part of GE. They're buying, so their sales have gone up. It's a, a good outcome, in my opinion, and it's a great company. 
And finally, when you come back to New Zealand in another 10 years, what do you expect to see? Um, I expect to see some of the companies that we've trained today and last year and the year before will have grown to be 30 or $50 million companies. And that's what we're aiming for. I am not in favor of uh, kids starting companies in a garage or an incubator that grow to be six or eight employees and then stay level. We need to build serious, sustainable growth companies that can make it on the global stage. And really you need to be at 30 or 50 million or 100 million. And they're the ones that create the jobs. They also serve as a beacon for others to follow. They create spin-offs of their own. And very likely, they'll create suppliers that may go on to, uh, to grow and prosper as a result of their success on the global stage.